So the old saying goes, you only get one chance at a first impression, and suited for good, took it to heart. They are dedicated to helping men and women who are in the process of rebuilding by tailoring a new suit for them. The advantage is huge for these men and women in the interviewing process to gain employment. It becomes so much more than just a suit and a tie. Utah Woolen Mills, the vehicle behind Suited for Good, has been in business since 1905. They recognized the blessings they received and were excited to give back. For every suit they sell, they give a suit back to help rebuilding men and women in the workforce. Help me welcome today's inspirational speaker, B.J. Stringham, president of Utah Woolen Mills. Thank you. Let's see, let me switch the presentations here real quick. All right, here we are. Probably want to walk around a little bit, so I'm going to put this uh, microphone in my pocket. Does that work? Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm B.J. Stringham. Uh, I'm the fifth generation of a 112-year-old business called Utah Woolen Mills. It was started by my great-great-grandfather back in 1905. Well, I'll give you a little bit of history as I go through. Um, this building here was our actual mill back in, uh, it's on Richard Street. Those of you who know uh, downtown Salt Lake, it's uh, right across the street from Temple Square on the south side, and it cut the uh, block in half from uh, Main Street and West Temple. Um, so that's where the, the store was for a long time before they built uh, Crossroads Mall, and we found another spot. I'm just curious, uh, since it's been around for 112 years, I'm just curious in this crowd, how many of you have been to our store in Salt Lake City across from Temple Square by a raise of hands? How many of you have family that have been to our store? Okay. Um, just, just some fun facts that I, that I came across. When we began in 1905, the average life expectancy was 47 years of age. So uh, we could have some dead people in our room today. Um, not a lot, like five. I would say five. Um, only 14% of the homes in uh, the United States had a bathtub. So yeah, the population of Las Vegas was only 30. And the average speed limit in most cities was 10 miles per hour. Like my kids would get arrested at my house for that, uh, for breaking the speed limit. Um, back in uh, 1905, it actually began as a knitting company, and it was, uh, it, it was begun by the Lloyd family. Uh, my great-great-grandfather and his son became involved in the early 1920s, and uh, they brought their son into the business. His name is Bryant Stringham, and my, he's my grandfather. My grandfather, Bryant Stringham, is an amazing person. Uh, he happens to live in St. George. And so he is actually here today. I'd like him to stand up, if you wouldn't mind. And, and everybody give him a round of applause, if you wouldn't mind. I wouldn't be here today presenting if it weren't for my grandfather. If, I weren't for, if it weren't for his example on how to run a business, how to uh, be financially sound, how to respect the past while uh, reaching new goals in the future. All this I learned from that guy right there. I think uh, in this stage in his life, he doesn't have to work. We always give him grief that he should come and work. And, uh, but he needs to know how uh, appreciative I am of him. And, and this program would not be possible if it weren't for him. Here are, so, here are just a couple pictures, and we'll, we'll go through these. Uh, uh, to the left or to the right is my great great grandfather Henry Stringham, and then his son Brian Stringham, who is my grandfather's father. This is a great picture we came across when we were looking through some pictures. This is uh, in the background is my grandfather and his dad walking through the mill, and I just think that's such a cool picture. Um, 
to have some of this history. Uh, a couple more pictures of some, some of the tailors who used to work for us up in the uh, top left corner. This uh, picture right here in the top right, this was in the early 1930s, and Utah Woolen Mills, and actually back here is about the same period. Down here on the, uh, this is my great great my great grandfather great my great grandfather right there. They had a they had a traveling sales force of over 300 people that would travel the country and sell our goods. And this was a very big source of pride. This shipment was one false shipment. So these uh, these sales reps would go across the country and they would take these samples of what Utah woolen mills could make. And Utah woolen mills would produce from raw wool. They would clean the wool and they would uh, card it. They would weave it. They would do everything. And they would produce blankets and suits and sweaters. And, and I imagine your impression of what Utah Woolen Mills is is exactly what they used to be. Because everything was produced and everything was uh, um, shipped from our, our factory in Salt Lake City. So there's a lot of history that... Uh, that, that goes into Utah woolen mills. In fact, not many days go by that I'll have somebody come in that will say, my grandma used to work in your knitting. My, my grandpa used to uh, be on the road selling for you guys. Or somebody would come in from Seattle and say, hey, I used to buy, my grandpa used to buy uh, clothing from, you, from your salesman. So there's a lot of history in our company. And that's great. And we are definitely appreciative of our history. But I think one of the biggest things for us is not being um, sitting on our heels, relying on the history, uh, but rather recognizing, respecting that, and making steps to go forward. Who is Utah Woolen Mills now? We are, we are a completely different animal than we used to be. We, uh, I, think, I think the impression for those who do know Utah Woolen Mills, they think maybe uh, bulky sweaters and things to keep you warm. And, and, uh, but we've actually transformed into one of the top men's and women's clothing stores in the country. We've been listed in Esquire Magazine as one of the, um, well, one of the top men's stores in the country with, with just a listing of about uh, 30 stores nationwide. We're very proud of that uh, recognition. And how we've got there, how we have arrived at that point, is bringing some of the best brands from all over the world to Salt Lake City. Uh, brands like Keaton, Brioni, uh, Zenya, Isaia, Canali, Eton, and Byron. Uh, just, just, for, just for some fun facts, like I kind of put them in uh, top descending order. Uh, Keaton is a brand we brought in from Naples, Italy. The average price on a suit is about $9,000, and we should all get one of those. We can. <laughs> I'm happy to set up appointments. Just uh, <laughs> go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, so it, it can get insane, but they're, they're amazing. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Brioni, if you're a James Bond fan, it's the, the suit you'd see Daniel or, uh, Pierce Brosnan and all the guys wearing in, in uh, James Bond. Those are around $6,000 a piece. Hermenegildo Zegna is a very popular, popular line out of Italy. Um, actually, they're right across the border of Italy and Switzerland. So a lot of their manufacturing is in Switzerland and in Italy. They produce fabric. They're an actual mill, kind of like we used to be. They'll produce raw wool and make it into beautiful fabrics that are then made into men's uh, suits. Isaia is what I'm wearing today. It's a handmade suit made in, also in the Bay of Naples in Italy. Very light. So it'd be great for St. George. Uh, Eton Shirts is our best-selling shirt line we've ever had. We, uh, in fact, uh, speaking of from old to new, when I, when I approached my dad and said, hey, I think we need to be selling these shirts, he said, you're nuts, because they're $265 a shirt on average for a men's dress shirt, just cotton shirt. And, but I had so many customers saying, hey, why don't you guys sell these shirts? So we did a little in investigation, and we found that uh, they're amazing. They're made in Sweden. And we, uh, so we started buying these shirts. We're now uh, in so just in our little store in Salt Lake City, Utah. We're the top uh, specialty account in the country for Eton sales. We sell thousands of these shirts. They're amazing because you can pull them out of the washing machine. Like this one's been sitting in my car for the last couple of days as we've uh, brought our kids down to uh, hang out in St. George until I presented. And they're just easy. You take them out of the washing machine, hang them to dry. It's just, they're, it's over. So that's been a great thing. Um, uh, 
uh, we also have a beautiful women's department, which is something that a lot of people don't know. We do uh, brands like Max Mara, Ted Baker, and Schneider's from Austria. Um, part of who we are today is we're still a family business. Uh, this is, uh, that's me on the left, that's my grandfather right there, and then that's my dad, Bart, and my brother, Brandon. Um, part of the interesting thing that I get asked actually quite a bit is how is it to be in a family business, uh, especially when, uh, you know, families can be, you can want to kill each other sometimes. And we definitely have our, our days, but uh, the trick is us figuring out how our how to maximize our, our uh, personalities. Uh, there's my brother and I that we, we basically do all the day-to-day -day now. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're, my brother and I are exact polar opposites, and so it's, uh, although we've always growing up uh, just wanted, you know, like I mentioned, to kill each other, uh, it's actually worked out to be a very good thing. I'm, I'm more of an extrovert. I like to, I love the selling aspect of uh, the store. I love meeting people. Uh, Brandon is not, he doesn't love uh, meeting people, he's, but he's very like, he's very numbers driven and he's very, uh, he's very financially sound and, and it's a great thing because I go to go buy and I'm like, hey, yeah, we should do that, we should buy that, we should buy that and he's like, hang on, just, just settle down. Let's, uh, let's think about this. So as much as it drives me nuts that he's always pulled me back, it's actually a very good balance and because of that, we've been able to grow quite a bit the last few years. Um, and that's part of that, dividing up the, uh, the workload. Another thing in a family business uh, that we've learned from very early on, if any of you are in family businesses, is, is there can't be any, there's no free lunch, there's no entitlement to what you think you should have because you're, you're somebody's brother or you're somebody's son. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not actively grabbing a hold of the responsibilities and taking it to the next level, then uh, you shouldn't be there. And we've, uh, between my brother and I, we've very, we take that very seriously and um, we're always looking for opportunities to grow and we're always looking for opportunities to where we can maximize our natural tendencies and, and personalities. Um, the uh, growing opportunities com compared to what our family has traditionally done, one of the biggest changes we've made in the last probably seven years is when, when City Creek, uh, downtown Salt Lake City, when they uh, developed the mall, we actually, if you, if you came uh, downtown while that was going on, you know that the, it was just like World War III. There was a huge hole out the back of our door. We were the only little business, a red bi brick building, just us hanging out. And, uh, and we decided then and there, when the mall opened up, that we changed things. Uh, up until that point, I mean, my whole life, uh, seeing my dad get home, he, you know, he was there every day until 6. Uh, Christmas was crazy. He was there from uh, Thanksgiving till Christmas. I mean, every day from eight in the morning till nine at night, like for sure. You did not see him. He was at work, <clears throat> and that is if he got out on time. But it was just—it was just a very crazy pace. Uh, a lot of there, there was there wasn't a lot of freedom. We decided what we would do when the mall opened is we would prepare ourselves to be uh, to expand our hours and to hire more people to help us do what we. What, what we wanted to do, which was uh, grow our business. So now we're open every day, every night until nine. Uh, the only day we're open, or not open is Sunday. And we've got, uh, we've got three full-time guys working with us in our men's department, to, above and beyond what we ever had, and part-time crew. And the only challenge has just been the, con the constant training of, uh, of people, which is, which is a challenge, but it has, it has allowed us a lot more freedom. It's, it's allowed me to come here today, uh, which is not something we could have done years ago. So we've, we're always changing. Uh, a couple other aspects that are really important for our business is tailoring. Um, tailoring, when you're, when you're selling an $8,000, $9,000 suit, you can't afford to screw it up. Uh, so we've got the best tailor in the state, hands down. His name is Anwar Ali. He's from Pakistan. He started learning when he was uh, six years old from his uncle. The guy is incredible. I mean, we have, we've had so many instances where, where he has saved our, our butt. I mean, he's, he's incredible. Um, but we do have difficulty, and these are some of the, I'm just going to share with you some of the, the challenges of our business as well as some of the triumphs. But difficulty in finding trained tailors, uh, is, that's, that is a big challenge for us. 
uh, there aren't many people who are going into that industry and, and wanting to become a tailor and, and, and learning that uh, trade, but it's vitally important to us, and we actually have two tailors who are training with our master tailor because it is very important. We, we're the first ones to acknowledge we couldn't do anything we, we're doing now without our master tailor. Um, I had uh, one story I wanted to uh, tell you. We had, uh, we had a customer one time that wanted to buy this very expensive sport coat, but had side vents, and he was not a fan. And he said, you know what? I gotta have this jacket, but it's gotta have a single vent. And I just, I was, well, you know, you're gonna put me in a tough spot. <laughs> Nothing I knew about that. So I went down, I talked down to the, to the tailor, and he said, well, maybe we can do this. And the next thing I know, he, he cut off the fabric from the inside and replaced, I mean, it was amazing. And he just created something that I didn't even know was possible. And there have been so many instances where, where he is, uh, well, and every day, it's, uh, it's vital to have him. Um, another big part of what we do at Utah Wool Mills, it's the underlying structure for everything that we do is quality. We will not settle for anything else. Uh, I've just outlined a couple things. Uh, canvas front suits, if, if you're curious about that, just look, look up uh, on Google, what is a canvas front suit? It's basically a camel hair canvas that runs through the front of your suit that will look good years and years and years. Our suits start at $895 because they're all canvas front, so you can have a suit from us for 15 years and it will never get the puckering and the sloppiness in the front because unlike the other options out there that are glued, it's, it's a mass production type model. Ours is very individual and very uh, it's all got to be done with canvas. Everything we do is hand tailored. The fabrics are beautiful. We bring them in from all over the world. And fabric allowance on everything we, we do so that we can let things out, we can alter them to make them fit. But everything that goes out our door at Utah Woolen Mills is tailored to fit whoever is buying the product. Um, and that's, that's what my day every day consists of, is teaching people the difference between quantity and quality. Because I know as well as anybody that you can go out and buy you know, 10 suits and get a, you know, three or four free or whatever the deal might happen to be. Our, our line is strictly quality. It's got to be the best or we won't sell it. Uh, I was just reminded, actually I was doing this, I uh, put this slide up last night. Uh, my wife and I came down and uh, thought we'd make a little trip out of this. We, we threw in our trusty stroller that we bought 11 years ago when my, before my little girl was born. And we just, we kept looking at this stroller and it was a $500 stroller at REI. And there were so many options out there for like 50 bucks. And we just, we kept going back to reviews and we finally decided, you know, let's do it because we're going to have a family. And that stroller is with us today and we have beat the tar out of that thing and it still doesn't look great, but it, it works. And that has just been just a simple instance. And I'm sure you all have your, your examples of, of why uh, quality is important, but it is very important to us. Um, so celebrating 112 uh, 12 years in business this year, what are the keys to the success of our business that I could share with you? <clears throat> Number one is people. <coughs> Excuse me. It's all about people, 100% about people. And all of you that are in business, you know that's true because you can have the greatest product in the world, but if you don't have people that care and that can take care of the people that are your customers, and I'm not talking about just um, people that work for you, but your the customers that support your business, um, taking care of them is number one. And wh what I've noticed is the more we reach out and try to take care of our customers, the more they, uh, the more they support our business. So it's, it's an absolute win-win. Um, number two is a very big deal, is financial responsibility. Uh, my grandfather, years ago, uh, he decided, you know what, if we can't pay for something, we can't afford it. And he was very, very frugal with the money that he had. And that is something that we, to this day, we're in a very strong position in our business because of his example of if you can't buy it, if you can't pay for cash, you can't, you can't buy it. And uh, that, might, uh, that might be an immediate, uh, well, it is. It's an immediate uh, obstacle to growing your business. But if you can somehow figure, figure out ways to do it without uh, going into debt, uh, it's, that's, that's the reason why we're here today and that's why we're, we're stronger than we've ever been in our business. Um, number three is adaptability. Uh, changing from where, what we were to who we are. Uh, I have people come in our store every day now and they, they, they're amazed at the changes we've made. We just added another 2,000 square feet. 
the brands we carry, everything we've done to update our store. If there's one thing that you can't do as a business is rely on who you were yesterday and, and the successes you had yesterday because th those are not the things that, uh, that will help you grow or even stay in business. The, the, the environment right now is so tough with online. I mean, it's, it's a very competitive uh, world. And if, if we rely on things that we did yesterday, uh, I think it's going to make it very difficult to stay in business uh, tomorrow. Um, anyway, that's, I guess that's a little repetitive. Um, importance of first impression. When I about, it was probably in uh, 2000, I had gotten home from a mission. I spoke Spanish, and this guy came into the store. He was impeccably dressed. He, had, he, he kind of, he went like this and showed me, you know, kind of flashed his uh, Prada suit, and I was like, wow, this guy is going to spend a lot of money. And he went into the dress room to try on a couple suits, came back out, had his briefcase, and walked out. And, and uh, my dad had said, you know, I think uh, that was kind of strange. And I said, yeah, it was strange. Because he said he, he spoke Spanish. And then I started speaking Spanish to him. And he was like, eh, it's been a while. I can't remember. And uh, anyway, I was not very smart. The guy ended up walking out in, with one of our suits. Long story short, I had just trained for my first marathon. And I chased him down. And <laughs> Got the cops involved. We said, hey, you can either pay for the suit or we can press charges. And the only way he would show me where the suit was is if he had me promise in front of the police officer that I wouldn't press charges. So when I got the suit, I called up the, the owner, Bart, and I said, hey, Dad, I got the suit back. What do you want me to do? He said, well, now tell him if he doesn't pay for the suit, you'll press charges. And the, the guy who stole the suit from us said, well, you promised. And I said, well, you stole from me. I lied to you. I guess we're about even. So <laughs> you can either pay for the suit or we'll press charges. So what do you want to do? So anyway, he had one of his buddies. He called on his, his uh, buddy on a phone, and then he brought cash and paid for the suit. Anyway, the point in the story is that first impression. The guy walked in. He looked like a million bucks. And I just assumed, I just assumed. And how powerful is that first impression? When you look at somebody, you judge them immediately. And then all the information they give you after that initial impression just backs up what you initially thought. If, they, if you look at them and you think, man, he looks kind of uh, sneaky, then everything he says to you, you think, yeah, that's what a sneaky person would say. But if the person is uh, dressed properly, it's amazing how your brain just automatically gives people a pass, even on things that would maybe throw up a red flag. Uh, we, we did a very interesting project. Um, if anybody wants to see it, it's on our, our YouTube channel, Utah Woolen Mills. Uh, we had one of our guys thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if, I wonder if people would take money from a homeless guy. So he got out there, he looked completely disheveled, dressed in his shabbiest clothes, and sat down in front of our store, and he had a, a bucket that said, here, take free money. So as people would walk down the street, he would say, do you want a dollar? Instead of the traditional, can you give me a dollar? And it was amazing how many people would not take a dollar from him. And then we, video, we videotaped him in a suit doing the same thing. Would you like a dollar? And everybody took a dollar from him. <laughs> it's amazing. You can't even give away money if you don't look the part versus looking the part. It's, it's amazing. Um, the, the value of that first impression is incredible. I want to show just a quick little... A quick little example of this. That's the same guy. So who you just saw, his name was James Sabe. 
James Sabe is a gentleman we... Hi, I'm Ashley Weston. I'm a celebrity menswear stylist. This Don't video is her. part of my men's clothing fit guide. Today, we are here... She doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Wow. Man, I'm glad my browser's clean. <laughs> All right, let's get it back here. Or not. Anyway, wh while I'm waiting for this to, to load back up, um, it's frozen. Would somebody come up and just try to keep this Oh, wait. There we go. Kind of want to hear that stylist again. <laughs> My computer is restarted because of a problem. Okay. I think it was that girl. She was pretty annoying. <laughs> All right. Give me just a second. Let's see. Anybody know any good jokes? <laughs> okay, while this is rebooting, let me, would, Pam, would you mind, just when it, when it is ready, just, just let me know. Um, so the gentleman you just saw on the video, his name is James Sabe. Uh, let me give you a little background about him. He uh, is homeless, he was living in his car. Uh, we we decided back in in December. Let me actually give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of history. Last uh, February, I went to a an event where a, a few of our customers were putting on a fundraiser for a family that was in need. It was uh, the Joseph Smith Memorial Memorial Building, and they were just great customers of ours. And they came up to they came up to me and they said, they said, Hey, would you mind? Would you mind? We're doing this this fundraiser, and would you mind uh, at Utah Woolen Mills offering something that we could raffle off to help this young family? And I was like, Well, you know, we get we get a lot of okay, thanks. We get a lot of requests, and I just I don't know. I you know, then they showed me the picture of the family. Uh, it was a uh, husband and wife of a young family. They had two young children. And when I saw the, the picture of this family, she, the, he, the, the couple that was our customer, they started telling me, they said, you know, here's the situation. She's got a brain tumor. They've got medical bills that are mounting up like crazy. And we need, we need money to help them take care of their bills. So after seeing the family, I, I said, okay. So what we ended up doing is we ended up uh, donating a suit to to raffle off, you know, to see how much money we could raise for this family. And they invited me to go. So I went to this, uh, this event, and when I got there, I don't remember ever a time in my life feeling so much love between just people I had, I didn't know anybody there. So I just felt like I could go to anybody in this room and just give them a big hug. So what happened then is as I was, as I was at this, this event, I was so emotional seeing all the love and, and the suit raised a bunch of money, but there were so many other vendors there that were raising money for this family. Thank you very much. Um, so it just got my mind working. As I left, I, I called my dad and I called my brother and I just said, we have got to do something. We, I, I want this feeling more. Like we got to do something to help people. I didn't know what that was, but I knew we had to start a foundation. So we got the, the wills in, in motion to start a foundation to help people. And then a few months later, back in, uh, I think it was September of last year, I had an opportunity to go listen to Blake Mikowski. He is the, the CEO of uh, Tom's Shoes. Tom's Shoes, for every shoe they sell, they give one to someone in need. Uh, he, I, I, I listened to his experience, and I was inspired. He just said, he said, I went to Argentina, and there were kids that, couldn't go to school because they didn't have shoes. That was the rule. You had to have shoes, couldn't go to school, no shoes. So he was down on sabbatical, and, and one of his friends got him to, 
to volunteer and go provide shoes. But then you thought, well, if I just give a bunch of shoes, that's not going to solve the problem. I need something that's perpetually providing. And so he came up with this idea of every, every shoe he sells, he's going to have that finance the shoes that he gives away. And then after I heard that, my brain was just kind of going nuts because I was like, we got to do something like that. That's like right in line with what I want to do with our company. We've got such an amazing business. We've got such amazing customers. I see Don Ibsen here, and I, and I think we've got so many people. We could, we could harness our, our efforts and the good hearts of our customers to help. And so at a, at a sales meeting at the store, I brought up the idea. It's like, hey, why don't we do, why don't we do a suit for every suit we sell? Why don't we give? And, and the, at the sales meeting <laughs> at our company, everybody's like, oh, well, you know, it's kind of already been done and this and that. And, and yeah, why don't we do this? And so I kind of got off it, but I was, I was still, I wasn't, I, I wasn't ready to let the idea go. And then I talked to another one of my friends. His name is uh, Michael McHenry. He, he's the president of, of Even Stevens. Anybody ever heard of that by chance, Even Stevens? Is there a location here? Yes. He, uh, he's got, in, in three, two and a half years, almost three years, they're opening another five locations. I think he, he'll have 12 locations within three years. They just donated their millionth sandwich. Actually, they're at 1.3 million sandwiches. It took McDonald's like seven years. I asked him that the other day. I was like, didn't it take McDonald's like five years? And he's like, seven. And uh, anyway, he came into the store, and I was selling him a suit. And I just, and I was asking him about his, his business. And he said, he said, BJ, he said, you got to do it. He said, it is so amazing. The successes you have in your business are a success in the community. He says, you, you need to do it. And that was the push I need. And so what we did, James is our first guy. We got a hold of him through Catholic Community Service in Salt Lake, and we outfitted him. When he came to the store, he was as disheveled, homeless looking as you could possibly be. I hadn't met him, and he walked in 30 minutes late. I had KSL was there. I had a hairdresser. I had another videographer who did that video, and he was nowhere to be found. I called the homeless shelter, and I said, hey, where's, where's our guy? And he's like, well... I don't know, they're kind of like that. They don't kind of show up a lot. And I was like, well, you know, he's like, well, it might be why he's in this situation. And I was, it, was, it was very frustrating. He wasn't there. And then he walked in. And I knew, because I do this every day of my life, when he walked in, he was going to make an amazing makeover. And so we made him over, and he, it was so emotional. It was emotional for everybody, every one of us there. And he walked out the door and have not heard back since. And that's been a very frustrating thing for me because this isn't about just putting a bunch of suits in a room and, and letting people go get suits. The program we came up with is for every suit we sell, we're going to tailor and give a suit to someone in need. Um, this isn't about, it's about that feeling when, and you all know how it is, when you wake up in the morning and you put your best clothes on, whatever that might be, for guys, you know, putting on that tie and looking yourself in the mirror and thinking, putting on the jacket and feeling like, you know, I can do whatever, whatever I want. You know, I'm the man. I'm the woman. I can do whatever I want because I, I feel like I look the part. That's what we want to give to the people who are in need and who are looking to make that change in their life. Uh, the who. We partner with nonprofit organizations, uh, Division of Workforce Services, the LDS Church, uh, all these nonprofits that are trying to help people get back into the job market, these are the, these are the folks we're partnering with. We want their caseworkers to send us the people who are ready. We don't want to outfit James who will take the suit and I don't know what he did with it. We want, so we're tracking everybody who's getting a suit. They're signing a release form and we're tracking in three months, six months, and a year. We want to see who which organizations are bringing us the best candidates so that we can give them more suits in the future. Um, today, we have outfitted 100 men and 20 women in brand new suits. We, uh, these folks have done everything they can to back on their feet, but they need that finishing touch to get the job. We had an amazing opportunity with, with one of our first guys. His name was Brian Smith. Um, I, we got, my brother and I got back from a, a buying trip in January, and it was on, it was on, a, on a Tuesday. And I got this email from this guy. He said, in the email, more or less words, he said, thank you so much. 
He said, I have been jobless for a year. He said, I've had over 180, 180 resumes sent out, and I've been rejected countless times. He said, but I went into that interview. I, he said, I picked up my suit on Saturday. I had a job interview lined up for Monday. He said, I walked in there. I knew I looked the part, and I got the job. And he sent us an email the following day on Tuesday and said, thank you so much. I got the job. I was so excited. I, I was, in fact, I'm already forgetful as it is. And I left all of my luggage on the shuttle. And my brother and I were walking back to the car. And I was like, yes. And he's like, where's your stuff? I was like, it's on the shuttle. So we had to jump back in the car and go get it. And, uh, but it was so amazing to have that kind of success right off the bat. We just started in January. And since then, we've had even more folks get jobs. Uh, it's, been, it's just been amazing. I want to share a couple of the stories with you. Uh, who knows what this uh, browser is going to pull up this time. Let's see. Spent a lot of time with my boys. Love to play sports. These guys are studs. Single father. I think it's been an awesome experience. I was so lucky to go on and play uh, at the collegiate level and uh, play baseball, it was a great experience and uh, something I get to pass on to my, to my boys. You know, little things ha kind of have to happen in, in, in order to, for your life to, to really fall apart. You know, being homeless, I mean, wow, that's, it's very difficult to work your way back up. There's so much help out there for people, but it's so hard for them to get. In moving forward, sometimes you need you need a helping hand. I was really impressed with what it was that I perceived they were doing, and I thought it would be something that I should I should pursue. Not just a suit uh, to wear to an interview, but it represents a new beginning. It represents hope, opportunity to. Start again. It is about the guy that's underneath the suit. That was Craig. He was one of our first guys. He has since got a job. He, uh, th those videos were actually shot at a house right next to my mom and dad's house. And um, he, after we had them over for di family dinner at my mom and dad's house, and after dinner, you know, I. I Round up our kids and we're getting in the car to go and and uh, and I found out later that my mom said, "Hey, did you guys to the kids, do you want to come back and get some? Do you want to come back and get some pie?" And she asked Craig, the dad, she said, "Where where are you guys? So what are you guys? Where are you staying tonight?" And he said, "Well, we're just sleeping in, in our car." And it was it was very it was very real to me how big uh, of a help this could be and that now he has since got a job. That's one thing, that's one less person that's, that's on the streets. I want to share one more video and then I want to sum it up. Home sweet home. My name is John Boss. I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. My life has been handing me a lot of challenges. I am a disabled veteran. Due to an accident, um, I was in a tank accident. I suffer PTSD. I became what I thought I'd never become. I became homeless. I've had to take showers in gyms. I've had to sleep outside. If you close these curtains for the privacy, you can see how little room you got. I heard about Suited for Good. It's just like for every suit they sell, they're giving one suit away to an applicant who qualifies for moving their life forward. The suit isn't what makes me, but it definitely gives me the confidence, courage to stand with society in the ranks where I am a professional. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come speak today. And if there's one thing I could, I could share with you is if you can somehow in your businesses incorporate a way to help people 
in the way that you already, in the business you're already doing, if there's a way to do it, I strongly, strongly recommend it. I have been so touched the last, it's only been four months. I've been so touched and changed by the people I've met. I was talking with Pam about the Other Side Academy. These, these folks are people who have all been incarcerated. They're all ex-cons. I'd say go to your websites and look at the Other Side Academy. They're all trying to get back on their feet. We just had the amazing opportunity. We had uh, 40 of them, 35 of them, come to our store. We did a Dress for Success seminar, and then we outfitted every one of them there. And I, offering that to them, you would have thought that we just, that they just won the lottery. And to see them come out of the dressing rooms and to never have had that image of themselves that they can be successful, that they, that they can be something, there's something about that imagery when you see yourself like you've never seen yourself before. And I would strongly encourage every business here to figure out how you can do something to this effect in your business because not only is it great for your employees, for your own morale, it also is great for business. I've had numerous people come in and shop in our store that have never been in our store before because they, wanna, they want to support what we're doing. And that's all I got. Is working. Thank you. Thank you so much, BJ. That was really great. And uh, so I'm in need. I love Ted, Ted Baker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll give you my size later. Anyway, um, thank you so much for everything. On behalf of our Chamber of Commerce and also um, our members, I'd like to give you a little piece of our St. George area. Thank, thank you, you so much. Also, I'd like to do a shout out. I don't know if BJ said it, but this is his grandfather right here. Let's give him a hand. And I just want to recognize Don Epson. Senator Epson's here today. Woo! It wasn't me that brought him in. It was BJ. And also, Eric Dodge. I mean, he never comes, so I'm just going to point it out. All right. If you'll just bear with me one more second, what I'd like to do is I'd last, like to ask all of our staff, our board members, and our sunshiners to come up for just a moment for me, please. What a great group. I'm so thankful for all of these people here. They really support and keep our chamber going, and I just love each and every one of them. As uh, I'm going to try not to cry, as most of you know, our director of membership, she's only been here for six months, she has really stamped um, a place in all of our hearts. She got married, daggummit. <laughs> um, he hasn't shown his face yet because I'm taking him out at the knees. If I don't, John will. <laughs> Um, however, um, we just want to recognize her. I know that uh, she has really, anybody that she's met in our chamber, she has stamped a place in their heart. She's such a wonderful, uh, joyful individual, great employee, and I'm really sorry to miss her, but um, I do wish her all the best. So, Jen, come on up. Susie. Thank you all very much. So somewhere floating around was a booklet that everybody was signing. If somebody can just, oh, okay, there it is. Jen, that's yours. So please grab that on the way out. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you at the chamber. It'll be at our building for the training next week, next Wednesday. Thank you very much. Have a great week. <laughs>